17 and all your dreams are knocking on your front door. I'm coming to you in the most vulnerable state of my life ever. 25, you realize that nothing is the same as before. I struggle with that boundary and I do struggle with saying no. Where did we go? Where did we go? Where did we go? All of those years. My kids deserve their mom sober and alive. How did we end up? How did we end up? How did we end up here? I am done. I am okay being by myself. Is it all? Oh, a lie. Hi, beautiful people. I'm Rachel Sievers, and you're listening to Consent to Treat. Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to Consent to Treat. I'm Rachel Sievers, life coach, counselor, and I cut my cat's food with the cheap stuff. So I buy her the good stuff, and then I get meow mix, and then I shake it all together. I can't afford all that expensive food all the time. Today, we are listening to a real-life counseling session between me and John, a 31-year-old male born in the Philippines who moved to the United States when he was in middle school. He comes from an extremely rigid, hyper-Catholic Navy background. In his most natural state, John is all energy, vibration, guided by the higher power, spiritually tuned in. But family expectations, cultural norms, and roles like being the eldest, being male, being a Navy mechanic, being the fun party guy, have kept him from reaching his highest potential. This season, we watch John shed off roles and take a huge step toward his highest and best. John doesn't use his session time to work on things like relationship or communication issues. John thinks big. He uses his time in session to contemplate ideas, ponder the universe, wonder about himself. He can clearly see his connection to the earth, others, all things, and this makes him incredibly unique. Now, if only he could see that. For the sake of his privacy, we are keeping John's real name and identifying information hidden. He has given us permission to record and publish this session. Please be aware, sessions with me always include mature language. All right. And with that, hate it, love it, learn something. Enjoy. This season of Consent to Treat is brought to you by The Retreat. Along with a long list of experts, I have carefully crafted a retreat that I would want to go to four days from sunrise to sunset. You will get to choose the experience that you want to have sunrise yoga or sunrise workout meditation, a workshop with me learning how to quiet the world so you can hear the voice within you delicious food prepared by chefs workshops on narcissism, sexuality, Qigong, live music, art therapy, massages available every day. You will not want to miss this transformative experience at beautiful Sequoia Lake here in California. It's going to be four days that will transform your life. Check out my website, arrivecoachandcouncil.com forward slash the retreat. Welcome back. This is interesting. We talked about this on another episode, how like Olivia, I see her every other week consistently. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot that happens in between the recorded sessions that listeners don't hear. But for us, I don't think I've seen you since our last recording. You haven't. I I haven't gotten. Yes. I'm 100% sure. Okay. I have it in my memory bank of a mind. I haven't seen you. Okay. So there's a lot to fill me in on. There is a lot. It's quite a lot, actually. I mean, unless you want to talk about something else, don't no, let me. No, yeah. Do you want me to do that? Is yeah, it... we'll talk about whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> All right. Well, that's true. So, I don't know. Went through a breakup. Was very eye-opening in terms of, you know, my own flaws. And it was very constructive for the both of us. Yeah. You know, we're still good friends. We still talk. And... Something happened in the middle where I was just like, all right, well, I don't want to sound cliche by saying my 30s is scaring me because it's right there. It's literally in two months, I'm going to turn 30. But also just, you know, the pressures of life, 
I was like, I cannot keep living this way. I'm literally a child. I'm living like a child that doesn't, like I didn't, that's big parts of my life is not how I want to be living. Mm -hmm. Therefore now I have a choice and I'm not choosing that so that, you know, life is choosing it for me. Mm. So yeah, it was like, was this something that she kind of pointed out during the breakup process or is this is something that you came to on your own after my family were saying it, my, she was saying it. Some of my closest friends were saying it. It was, I was having, basically I had, all the people that love me say, telling me no BS stories about myself. Like, hey, maybe maybe you should get a job finally. Mm. Like, how long is, you know, like, maybe that'll keep you busy. And I, in my mind, I was obviously, like, very combative with the fact. I was like, I don't want to live under the Western capitalist rule. I was like, I still live in a relative reality where we need to do those things. Yeah. And weirdly enough, a few things came together. One of my really good friends brought me to a little piece of land. And he's like, yeah, we have a little farm here. We raise chickens and goats. And I was like, oh, that sounds super cool. And I was like, I've been home for as long as I know. Like, I just stay home sulking in my in my own little depressive state and not doing anything, just succumbing to my little addictions. And it was, you know, it was dark at times. It got darker when I got through the, through the breakup. I went through a a phase where I was just like, all right, it's time to go back into the dating world, which is, it wasn't terrible, but it was still like, wait, I can't just step out there after being in a relationship for almost two years. You know, I'm like a guy that goes home and like cooks and cleans and do all the cool stuff that dudes do. But I wasn't a single guy at the age of 22. I was a single guy at 29. Which is probably doesn't sound like a lot, but... How is it different for you? What's the meaning behind that for you the, at 29? The meaning behind that was I can't keep acting like a newly 21-year-old sailor, you know, trying to talk to girls and drinking alcohol and partying. And just, I was at some point, I was like, what am I even celebrating? Like, what am I partying for? Like, it just felt empty again because mm. I was like, it's not because I didn't earn it. It was just like, I was numbing. But like, how long, (laughs) Mm -hmm. how long am I going to do this? I was suffering because of my own doing. I was like, I could probably flip this and actually like choose my own suffering. I made a silly goal and a good and like a rational goal. The silly goal was to, I asked my friend, I was like, hey, can I help out at the farm? And I did. The other end of that was me saying, all right, but also this is so much fun for me, but the bills have to get paid somehow. Mm -hmm. So I got a seasonal job at Costco. And then those two put together, now I don't stay at home. Like, I haven't been at home since that day. Like, you know, I just go to work. Because you're so busy? Uh, Because I'm so busy. In the middle of that, my grandmother also died. So that's another eye-opening thing because I got to see my family in the Philippines. And at this point, I was applying for jobs. My mom was like, hey, I need somebody to go with me to the Philippines. And your dad can't because... Your little sister has school. I was like, I'm applying for jobs. What do you want me to do? It's like, give it to God. <laughs> Just, I was like, all right, we'll do that. Your mom said, give it to God? Yeah, my mom said, give it to God. And I was like, all right, uh, I'll, I won't worry about it now. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. Went to the Philippines, saw how my family was living. I saw how utterly ungrateful I was about all the things that I had. And I was oh. like, oh, I'm taking this. I'm taking all this for granted. How the, How is your family living? Oh, they're living like above their means. But some of them, you know, like, I don't know how to explain this, but some of my families have like, they didn't go to school. They're reselling stuff so they could put their kids through school mm-hmm. or their kids doesn't have new stuff. I saw all my old clothes, shorts, jacket, shoes, and just about every family member that I had that can fit them. We're wearing your old clothes? My old clothes from, I'm talking about from eighth grade. Wow. And I that totally skipped my mind where how, I was like, I don't receive old clothes. I have the ability to actually go to Target and buy new stuff even, you know. Yeah. I was also forced to see it from a perspective of somebody that lives in a first world country. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the decision was made. I was like, you have to do something. Something has to be done. 
your credit cards are due, your bills are due, your blah, blah, blah. Everything is due and everybody's beating down your neck for money. And I was like, all right, it's time to face reality. Mm. So I started working and my first paycheck, I cannot describe the happiness. I don't know what it was of me getting that paycheck and piecing off a big chunk of it and throwing it at my water bill that's been staring at me for two, three months. Mm. And actually calling everybody to be like, hey, I just got a job. I promise to pay you at this time, blah, blah, blah. If you guys, you know, I was looking up on YouTube how to haggle with creditors. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's cool because I was getting the experience. But it's also so terrifying. I don't like talking to people like that. Like, I felt like I'm almost begging them. And I, mm. I was like, oh, my family will be so disappointed in me. Good thing they don't know this side of me. You know, like the the guy that, that they thought was living the best life in America. Here mm. he is, you know, like drowning in bills. Ugh, annoying. Anyway, so I started working just a season, as a seasonal employee. Um, and at the same time, I haven't left the farm. I'm there like every day. I just came from there, actually. I was there at 7, 6 a.m. this morning. Oh, until wow. Until like five. 12 hours ago. Yeah, almost 12 hours ago. So those two things combined, it's like, it's my life right now. I barely eat. I eat like, I don't get hungry anymore. I looked at myself a few, like I thought working out and dieting and all this new age things are going to fix my weight problem with my chubby face, but the weight fell off so like something so hard became so easy all of a sudden mm. like i was like oh this is it i'm just gonna be fat forever <laughs> <laughs> which is silly to think but in i didn't know where to go because i was like i'm working out i'm eating okay lying to myself obviously i wasn't eating okay i was stuffing my face every night mm. something happens when there's like ew i don't want to say it but like it's like purpose and like i have really wait, good wait, intentions wait, wait, wait. why don't you want to say that because it's overused. Everybody's like, oh, I'll just live your purpose. I, I I, just, I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> okay. I'm just spiteful <laughs> about this, um, about the TikTok people. Well, and we don't have to use the word purpose. What I was thinking is we underestimate the connection between mind, body, spirit always. Oh, yeah. And you can't have a healthy body if your mind isn't healthy and your spirit isn't healthy. You know, it can't, they always work together. It's interesting how, you know, keeping busy, having quote unquote purpose or whatever the fuck you want to call it. It's translating immediately to your physical health. Yes. Physical transformation as well. I haven't been to the bars. I haven't gone out for the, the reason of I'm going to party or I'm going to get wasted or I've drank alcohol, but with just my friends and family during like occasions but it's not a hundred dollar bar tab on a to forget about life to forget about life yeah, yeah to live a different life that obviously i'm not living i didn't want to say anything of course because that's rude you're clearly different looking now it's the weirdest thing and i'm like oh yes i get happy from it but then even then i'm like ah oh, that was yeah that was so yesterday's problem that's not my problem anymore like mm -hmm. i have so many other things i can fix mm -hmm. with the whole wow, farm things oh. can change so quickly they can everything can change so quickly it's such a reminder like when we're in those dark places you can't imagine things different no that's the characteristic of being in the dark places i i can't even imagine it better yes did not imagine this at all right but within days days and even that like days don't even like a day is not enough for me now i wish it was longer back then i was like oh my god i can't wait for this day to be over i'm like Yo, a day is not enough for me right now. Like, I want to do what I like doing. And oh my God, when I just love getting there when nobody's there yet. To the farm? To the farm. Yeah, I tell just, me about it. You know, like... What are you doing out there? Tend to chickens and goats and just do whatever. I build little things. And I was just like, wow, I'm building stuff with my hands. And I'm researching all the time. I'm like, what is going on? How beautiful when I think about it like that. But yeah, that's about it. It's really not much to it. It's that's, really not much. Come on. I mean, there's the nuances. So oh, I mean, there's so much. You went through an uncoupling. Yes. With a beautiful woman. 
Yes. That, yeah, I know you care for it deeply. You've explored the dating world, which unveils all sorts of shit within yourself. Oh usually my gosh. when you step out into that, oof, there's a lot of stuff that comes up. I've realized that I'm not that good of a, something takes over and I'm just like, a, it's like, a, I don't know if it's a coping mechanism of me growing up, but it's like dating is a game and it's just like the nice guys finish last thing is it's true on the dating world on the dark dating world where people are just buying alcohol it's true like all you have to do is read the prince by machiavelli or you know (laughs) that's it (laughs) or maybe (laughs) you could literally learn how to date on youtube or you know just learn about dark triad of psychology or something so what's the game like when you win what do you win like what's what's the goal i don't know they're like i haven't won like uh, well (laughs) the thing was that you win emptiness when you go through that i was operating for numbing and not love you win emptiness you win the feeling of emptiness with a side of just a little bit a tiny bit of depression for being not a good person (laughs) and i was in (laughs) I don't like that. I don't like that at Emptiness all. Emptiness with a side of depression. Yes. That's, you look. always have the best visuals. Thank you. But I, I get it. Yeah. That makes sense. I know that deep inside half the friends that I have, like they're way happier. Like I see my friends that are in like good relationships mm-hmm. that, you know, like, oh, it happened out of nowhere. And I found her and we looked each other in the eyes. I was like, oh, that's so lame yet so cool. I see the other side of that, the people that still, my friends that are still religiously trying to pick up girls every time and numbing and like not trying to uncover what's really wrong. And we all know it, like all of us talk about it. And they're like, yeah, dude, I know it's something, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Mm. It sounds like not fun. I was like, dude, yeah. It sounds like you're in for a ride for the next, at least a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Now that you've stopped numbing, is it clear what it was that you were running from? Yes. Yes. I was running away from growth. I was running away from responsibility. I was running away from the fear of, you know, like I'm being reminded that at the deepest root of it, I'm running away from the fact that I am getting older, thus me getting closer to dying, you know? Yeah, if I stay a child, a man child this whole time, I'm never going to die. Like a P, like you know, like the whole Peter Pan thing or whatever that is. Hmm. But life just has a great way of reminding you to just, you know, maybe it's not it. And it's, I couldn't be more grateful. But I don't know yet. I don't know. Like, like I don't know yet. I'm just, it's this, still, it's still kind of new. It is new. Okay. Yeah. It is new. Maybe, you know, maybe I was wrong this whole time still, but it's progress. I'll take it. Yeah. So there's, that stuff and then you were faced with death of someone pretty close to you very close yes Mm -hmm. and that even if it's an expected death or you know someone's in their end life stage it still conjures up really interesting things for us if we allow it and you return to your country of origin your family of origin Mm -hmm. that's huge it is huge wow and insane and saying how you come back, I guess, yeah, you're right. Like I was running away from growing because I was like, oh, there's no way. I I was a kid this whole time. But then I was like, at one point, my grandmother was also a young person. It's always a, like a kick in the butt reminder that death is around the corner for everyone. Yeah. Not in like this grim way, but like yeah. in a way that if I don't make the most out of this, like if I keep living in my illusion all the time like that i'm never gonna grow like yes like my time is ticking my time is ticking and Mm -hmm. it's that is the collateral beauty that comes along with death Mm -hmm. realizing your own mortality is the greatest gift that we can be given yes because without that awareness and knowledge you can't live no life does not exist without death yes the Good Place has an episode about this. I don't know if you watch The Good Place. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> You're quoting Marcus Aurelius, and I'm like, The Good Place the good has place. a good <laughs> <laughs> You're on a whole nother level. But there is like the heaven or whatever mm-hmm. where nobody ever dies, and they're fucking miserable. None of them live. Yeah. Because there is no death. And if there's no death, then why live? Well, that's the point. Right, right. Yeah. It's painful to 
be face to face with oh, that yeah. awareness. Scary. Scary. Right? The idea of that final breath. Yeah. But it allows you to live. It does. I got so good at grieving this past year. Both of my grandma passed. Mm. I'm no longer, I no longer have grandparents. Mm. It's the most freeing but fearful thing I've ever done is just letting grief ripple through my body. Mm. It's, it's a mess, you know, like I have to, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, up and down and twist and turn and in yeah. and out. It's everywhere. I don't even know when it's going to hit me. And then when it does, I'm like, oh, well, you know what to do now. Just let go. I'd be driving on the freeway. and be like, oh, it's time to cry. Just let it out. Yeah. And every time it gets easier, kind of. Yeah. And at the same time, it was kind of like grieving my relationship. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my God, this is so terrible. This is not going to end. Kind of like what you were saying about when you when you're in darkness, like you just don't know when it's going to end. Mm -hmm. And then one day you're like, huh, <laughs> I'm singing yeah. while washing dishes. And it's like, oh my God, my internal war is over. I'll go to Target, buy me a candle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess there was a lot that happened this past few months. Yeah, so much shift for you. There was. Also became best friends with my dad. If he's, if somebody looks up my call log, they're like, what is going on here? Just like using Facebook Messenger and FaceTime and regular call. And it's just like dad, 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 mom, mom, dad, mom. I never thought I'd, you know, I'd be this close to those two people, but like they'd become my best friends. Like, what, what do you attribute that to? Why do you think that is? I guess it comes back to the mortality. I know that they're not going to be here forever. I know they're not. So that happened after your grand your grandmother passed or? Yes, it happened then. But also through the whole farming thing, it's like a common ground for me and my father. He also raised goats and chickens growing up. Oh, is that right? Yes. Oh, okay. I have like 50 years of experience from him and I could always go to him for questions. You know, the little, oh, they have this thing. It's like, what do you do? Oh, he's just feeding peppercorn. I was like, that sounds like absolute BS, dad. That does not work. Peppercorns? It's like, yeah, I'll cure him. Watch. And it and it works. And I'm like, oh, I don't know anything. This guy's <laughs> a wealth of knowledge and I have not utilized him for what he's worth. I just saw him as boring old dad. Mm. My my <laughs> my drinking buddy in the weekends. Mm. Me and my parents are more alike than not. Wow. So that's cool because... Yeah, as you were kind of telling me about the last maybe six months, I was kind of wondering in my mind this stunted growth that you experienced over the last, what would you say, like maybe eight years? Because you, you said you're kind of like a child, a man child, mm -hmm. or, you know, you weren't growing up. I wonder how much of that was, was due to separation from family. I mean, I, I think so. Like, had you been alongside them, would that growth have continued? And I, I'm not even sure why I'm wondering that, because you were separated from mom and dad. For a long time. Yeah, in your childhood. I, I just, I don't know. I, I, It just kept coming to my mind, so I'm just speaking it out loud. I think one thing that I would attribute that to is them being away from me growing is I also had to learn for myself, right? But obviously it was biased because I was just like, I was learning this from YouTube or, you know, like I'm, I didn't get, like I was forced to grow up fast, but then there was a, a ceiling that I couldn't bust through. Mm. Mm -hmm. And now that when I joined my fraternity, which is, you know, which is, I don't know if I told you, I, I joined the Freemasons. Mm -mm. So I think it was being around older men when did this happen within the last year oh my gosh so i got initiated into the fraternity and last september i was raised to the sublime degree of master mason i don't even know what that means uh i'm sure like it... anyways it's uh <laughs> it's uh it sounds fucking rad it's cool. It's cool, right? When you say it like that. Yeah. A lot of people say it like that. It sounds it? super rad. Like it's, you should be wearing a fucking like cloak everywhere. That's what it sounds like. I think like carrying like a sword or a dagger or something. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. It's but really this deep deepest sense of it, it's it's I'm a twenty nine year old hanging out with people that are 
maybe two years older than me, five years younger than me, a decade older than me, and then so forth. So I'm just, I'm finally being initiated into like manhood and how you see it in different lights. I guess that's one thing that I was missing because I was living away from them, from my parents. Is that yeah. I still needed a mentor. I still sure. needed mentors. I still needed people to guide me where I should go. However, I was very scared to ask for help. Mm. But now I attribute this to my brothers. For the longest time, I was an only. I was the only son. So now I have brothers all over that I will not even hesitate to ask for help. If I just, you know, if I didn't know something about something, Beautiful. somebody, somebody knows it. You kind of had this concept of self put upon you or you assumed it for yourself that I'm the eldest son, America, military, going to make something of myself. There's like this expectation mm -hmm. on you to go out there and like do the man thing. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, you had no guide, no support, no village. No. So you, you're, you're kind of out here alone, reeling, trying to make this thing happen. And maybe it was like, fuck it, fuck it. I give up. Um, maybe I'm trying to overanalyze or something. I, I just, I think I'm seeing you in a different light today, maybe, or I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of just thinking out loud with you right now. I think it was the fact that I did put myself on a going step. I put myself in the pedestal. I was like, oh, only child did it stay military, like checked mm -hmm. all the boxes. You did. Yeah. Um, but really I was lacking something and I couldn't see it because, you know, like who's, who knows? I, I wasn't aware that sure. I was lacking in that, that part of my life. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have anybody. I, it was just like, all right, just learn as you go, but only go so far, especially for young men. And it takes like, it takes so many people. Like you, nobody can do this by, by themselves. Yes. I don't think. They yes. Can. Yes. Just having that support from the people that couple years ago i i i don't know them like i don't know these people mm -hmm. and now i'm a part of a bigger family that that has nothing but love and support for each other and some of the best things you know like this year has come from that from the freemason yeah from mm -hmm. being yeah. from being a mason like just the camaraderie and the brotherhood and the why are you rolling your eyes because because <laughs> people say brotherhood all the time that's what it is <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's just the the community, the mm -hmm. sense of community. Because I I belong to the bar community, which there's really not much growth there in terms of in my point of view. That's that's my own personal opinion. And whatever growth I could have had from that, I guess I hit already. Mm -hmm. And I was like, at this point, I was regressing. So I was like, oh, and it all happened by. Just pure chance. I called one of my old mentors. He's like, hey, I'm interested. I know you're a part of it. It's like, oh, that's all you had to do. Mm. I'm going to call somebody and they'll, you know, they'll usher you in, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, I'm crying in front of people because I was so grateful for the people around me, like my brothers and the lodge and, you know, all their families and how supportive and loving they are. Mm. And that's also one thing that happened this past few months. Huge. Huge. It's still happening, you know. Like before, yeah. I got here, one of one of the guys was just like, "Hey, you good? What's going on? I haven't blah blah." blah. I was just checking in. I was like, "Yeah, everything's fine." Everything, just called I'm, you up out of nowhere. Yeah, just called me. Just called me. It's like, "Hey, bro, I'm just thinking about you." I was like, "Wow, that's yeah." On a personal note, I've experienced uh, a, a lot of things over the past six months that have taught me the importance of connection with humans. Yes. There are some of us out there, and I think you might be one of them, that not consciously, but we've created this idea of like, I need I need to do this. I need to be able to do this on my own. I need to be able to take care of myself. I need to be able to supply myself, but not just financially, but emotionally, intellectually. I need to learn this stuff. I need, I, 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 I. Mm -hmm. And we can forget that our humanness means that we actually need not just want but we actually need connection with other humans to reach our maximum potential it opens something up in us that we actually cannot do alone it kills me to say this you know it was this badass independent woman i'm strong i yep. can do it myself right mm -hmm. which is a beautiful thing but 
the reality is, is I can't do everything myself. No. And neither could you. Yeah. You actually need guides. Yes. You need someone to, to check in on you every once in a while. Yes. And it, they could just be internet figures that I follow. Sure. You know, like they're like people that's here and now and like living with me and like, yeah. you know, yeah. take me to go fishing or like something cool, yeah. like something the the most minuscule thing means so much. Sure. And Being like, able to call dad and say, what, what should I feed my goats? Yeah. Or like, what should I, you know, like the whole me, I thing, like I could do is like cooking dinner and washing the dishes gets old after a while. Just doing it by yourself. I'm like, oh, I need some help, dude. Like this is, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it was getting repetitive and it was taking time away from the things that I want to do now. Mm. Like I said, the days are not long enough now because i want to do what i want to do so bad and i'm like oh all the help from the outside gets me that much closer to doing that i could sleep so well because i'm so tired and an internal voice saying oh you didn't work hard enough like bro what (laughs) before that even starts talking i'm passed out nice and i'm up again and like uh, you like i'm excited to get up i'm like Oh, never mind. Never mind. This is a whole different <laughs> life. I'm just kidding. I oh, rip open the windows, put sun in my eyes. And I'm like, oh, that's a new day. Alexa, play some Christmas songs. And <laughs> it's weird. It's so weird. I'm happy for you. Thank you. I am so happy that you honored the true you when you set out to make some changes for yourself. Yeah, I need to get a job. I need to pay my bills. And I need to do something that I love. I'm excited about because if you are just working at right now, it wouldn't be doing the same thing for you. No, you're working at and that's great. You can appreciate that pays the bills. It gives you these opportunities to practice mindfulness and meditation and gives you space to think. It sounds like, you know, yeah, it, it's doing, it's doing some cool things for you. Cool. But the fact that you get to go to the farm, when you talk about that, your eyes just light up smile like all your little smile muscles in your face engage and that it doesn't even matter how cold it is or how hot it is i'm just like what is going on i could equate it to how i felt when i was deployed it's like it doesn't matter we just have to get it done but the cherry on top is it's like i'm doing this in my own free will my body's moving by itself like oh it's so it's like relaxing in a tiring way yeah i couldn't be more grateful and I have way more connections every day. Even just like the whole nature stuff. Like goats are cool. Chickens are cool too. And they're all like alive things. Uh huh. And I'm like, oh, and you see them grow. And I'm like, wow, that's so cool. I did that. Right. That thing didn't die because of me. How cool. Yeah. Now it's all happy and hangs out on my form. And I walk it around. I was like, oh. A chicken? Yeah. You walk around with a chicken? Yeah. Like on my forearm. I, One of them got really sick mm-hmm. to the point where it wasn't eating. I was like, buddy, you got to get it together. <laughs> I was like, if you don't, <laughs> it's like, a, like um, it's like micro me. It's like all sick and like in a dark place. And I was like, here, dude. I a just micro fo- you? Is that what you said? Yeah. And I just force fed it. I was like. I did what life did to me. I just force fed it food, things that are good for it. Uh-huh. And I don't know what happened. And then like oh, two weeks later, I was like, oh, I'm alive, blah, blah, blah. I'll... Now you guys are best friends? Yeah. It jumps on my shoulder. Mm-hmm. I walk around. It's on there. I'm like, wow. I'm literally like, I'm a, I'm a millennial. And I've played the Pokemon before, you know, the uh-huh. Game Boy thing. I was like, I'm literally a real life Pokemon trainer. This is so cool. <laughs> The kid inside of me is very happy. Yeah. It's very happy. And I, like sometimes I'm like, I get do a little self-check on, you know, on that child in me. I'm just like, uh, what are we feeling? It's like, we're good. Let's go. Fuck Let's keep yeah. going. Fuck yeah. You're, you're where humans are supposed to be in nature. Yeah. And I'm caring like, for life. Uh huh. That's literally what we're built to do. It's the whole thing. I don't know if you've ever watched Biggest Little Farm on Mm-mm. Hulu before. Mm-mm. I've never thought I'd, I would cry about a farm documentary, but I did. Really? I watched it eight times and I cry every time. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so silly. Damn. But I'm like. I'm going to have to watch it now. Yeah. It's, 
they made it so well that it became like a tearjerker documentary. I was like, God, this is insane. There's <laughs> something here. And it's nice for once for me to follow through with my plans because before I was getting out the Navy, all I was doing at work was looking up how to start a farm, how to, how to tend to goats, how to, you know, like homestead life. Like a, just one step closer to that makes me so happy because like that was eight years ago. And finally, now I'm circling back and doing it. I'm like, oh, holy shit. I just, I'm here. Ooh, sir. I was like, oh my God. Okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've seen you try to attack other people's ideas of what your life is supposed to look like. Uh -huh. And you keep hitting walls, hitting walls, hitting walls. I got to go to school. I'm supposed to graduate. I'm supposed to get a degree. I'm supposed to buy this house. I'm supposed to, I'm, I, I'm supposed to do all these things, right? Everybody else's fucking ideas of what your life is supposed to look like. Uh -huh. And the universe keeps saying, no friend, no, do what makes you excited. Yeah. It... Do that. And that is where your success will be. Yeah. And it might sound crazy that being outside with the goats and the chickens, that's your life's purpose, but follow it that it, it's in there for you. It's in there for you. Keep doing that. Yeah. It will take you to your highest potential. Keep doing that. If you had done that when you got out of the Navy. <laughs> and the, okay, this is a side story to this. That's yeah. so weird. Hmm. Eight years before or eight, nine years before I told my dad about this farm. I was like, one of my friends that I'm not really friends with, we went to this farm. They had all these little things in there. Everybody was Filipino speaking, you know, our native language, blah, blah, blah. It was cool. A mm -hmm. bunch of, and then I kept telling my dad about this thing, this farm, this farm, this farm. And then I finally got into masonry. And then I was my, one of my brothers was talking about it. I was like, wait, where's, what are you guys talking about a farm? It's like, yeah, it's right. It's about 10 minutes away from here, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I think I've been there. It's like, does it look like this? It's like in between, you know, I, I described it as like, yeah. It's like, dude, I've been there eight years. It's like, we can go tomorrow. I was like, what? And now like me sitting back and processing it, I'm like, there's no way. How random it was. I was like, there's no way that that just happened. I couldn't have predicted this. I, oh, gosh. I'm not saying that it this... seems so, so like big, right? Mm -hmm. But to the universe, it's like, no, oh, dude, like it's easy. Yeah. I'll just connect you with this dude over here, get you on that farm. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> just, <laughs> it's, if you just, if I, yeah, if I, if I did a lot more shutting up and listening, I think, yeah, I think that's where it's at. And I, I don't think you are wrong at all. I think you're right by saying like everybody's influence on me. That have acted out thinking that it was my idea. All those plans went sideways, failed every single one of them. Ugh. Mm -hmm. And then you took it on as your own failure. Yeah. Rather than saying, no, the universe is just, it keeps telling me, no. Yeah. No, no, this is not me. This is not me. This is not meant for me. Yeah. It's so weird. Yet yeah, so cool. I want to see pictures of this farm. Cause remember when we did the, we did the visioning for your highest yeah. good? Remember that? Yeah. And I envisioned you outside mm -hmm. with like green trees and you were building something. Yeah, we were doing that earlier this morning. You were? Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Oh, gosh. I so I want to see pictures so of this farm to see if bumps. that's what my vision was. Oh, but my I mean, gosh. I remember that. I remember that time. Mm -hmm. What a weird time. I think we were just inviting in like what, what, yeah. what is his highest potential? What is his purpose? There, purpose. I said it. <laughs> and uh, patience too. Like, I, I was like, everything I've ever wanted, really wanted, like me, it's happening, but like not in my time frame, you know? Mm -hmm. If I just waited, because I don't, oh my God, what a good reminder for myself. Yeah. <laughs> I hope this gives you this much more confidence that you listen to your inner light fuck everything else and trust that if you are guided somewhere even if it sounds like in your mind like oh that's crazy that doesn't make sense or that's not gonna that'll look stupid or whatever do it anyways be guided by it it will always be right it will always be right fuck 
everything else. Yeah. Uh, I say yes, but I'm already doing the thing in my mind. I was like, there's no way, dude. Like, really? Are you? <laughs> I know. It's so scary. <laughs> it's so scary. Whenever I talk about it, it's scary, but it gets real, real tough sometimes. But like, I don't have to suffer so hard. But at the same time, I was like, I probably wouldn't have gotten here if I did it. And if I, I'd be lacking a little bit of perspective. Right, right. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just like that growth process is so cool. I hope, shit, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to explain this, but it's like, it's such a good feeling. Yeah. Do you feel peaceful in this growth process or, or has it been like, ah, exciting and sort of like scary? <laughs> it's been literally everything. And that's, I think that's the best way to say mm-hmm. it for me right now. Okay. But 51% of the time I'm at peace and I'm rushing somewhere. Yes. I'm like all over the place from one thing to another. I'm just like, oh, this is so cool. I'm glad to be here. And between phone calls with my parents, I was like, oh, dude, I, I love those guys. Great. It's been a lot of peace, a lot of love, and it's going to be good. And even if it's bad, it's going to be good. Yep. Say that again. Even if it's bad, it's, it's going to be, be good. good. Yep. It's... So beautiful to see you again. I always love spending time with you. Thank you. Yeah. So you're, you're very powerful. This is a good place to end. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Where did we go? Where did we go? Where did we go? And where have I been? Who am I now? Who am I now? Who am I now? And who was I then? And is it all? Welcome back, John. It's been a while since we've heard from him. Love him. He soothes my soul. Can I relate to John? I can relate to John, although his moves have been much more drastic. I can absolutely relate to making a move that everyone else thinks is just crazy, but doing it because I feel like that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And it just brings me joy. So I'm just going to do it. I can relate to that. And everything else that comes along with that, that feeling of alignment, that trust that you have to have in the higher power, trust in yourself to know that whatever is coming up for you is enough. That takes so much. I want to say, I was going to say power, but that's not the right, that's not the right word. No, takes is the wrong word. It gives you so much power. To believe in the fire, follow it, do it, trust God, trust yourself. That is such a magnificent place of power. I don't think he's seeing it that way, though. From the outside looking in, I can see that's where his power is at. I don't I don't think he's there yet, though. I think he believes he's like doing all these like little things for himself because they feel really good. I don't see him embracing it as his power as a spiritual being. Those little things <laughs> are not little. They're huge. They're him. They're everything. They're everything. How many years ago was it that he retired from the Navy and he had this idea that he wanted to go out there, create a ranch or some sort of farm for himself, a little homestead, I think he called it. And he just had this this vision in his head. And then he got caught up in all the things he's supposed to be doing as a male immigrant making the life for himself instead of going and creating that farm for himself. And now eight years later, he finally said, I'm, I'm going to the farm. And for him, it's like this silly, I, I'm just going to finally do what I want to do. But it's, it's huge. Going to the farm is his everything. It's where he was supposed to be eight years ago. It's all the same thing. Everything I teach to my clients, like it, it's all boils down to the same thing. What is true and right and authentic for you? Whatever it is, it's right. Do that. Literally everything I say, you could whittle it down to that message. I kind of do want to touch on the fact that John and I had a visioning session together and it was very, very powerful. 
the visions that came to me were just outrageously clear. I can still see it in my head. I can, I, I can still see John in front of me and he turns around his big giant smile and he kind of like kind of waves me closer to him. Like, come on, let's get to work. And, and there was like a bunch of people outside like working. And I remember there was like hills in the background and trees and it was kind of a cool morning. And after our visioning, I was like, John, I, I see you outside leading a group of people just happy as can be. And you're, you're, we're building something. We're building something. I don't know what you're building. I didn't know what that was, but you have a crew of people building something with you and you're kind of the leader, but not, not like the foreman, like the cheerleader. You're the cheerleader for everybody. And he was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Sweet. I think it's so significant that he is doing something close to the earth, something slow paced, something connected in with the natural cycles of the earth. It is so much more aligned with his frequency, the energy that he brings to the room. And I know you can speak to this now, Elodie, you can feel it, right? Like when he's around, there's like a, there's like a low level, almost like buzzing happening, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for him to be connected into something that also has a powerful buzzing energy, you know, growing animals, growing plants, being one in one and commune with that whole process is so much more in line with him. I'm not recommending that everybody go out there and, you know, raise chickens and goats. That That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying find the thing that's in line with your frequency and do that. What's beautiful and it's sort of lucky for him, his father did the same thing. His father raised goats and chickens as well. So I think that's given him enough external validation to make it feel okay to him that he's doing this. You know, I think he needed that because at the end of the day, he does feel pressure from the outside to do what he's supposed to be doing. I'm glad that his family has a history of that because had they not, he, he may not have allowed himself to join in that endeavor. I also relate to something else. Um, the passing of his grandmother, we didn't speak into it very much, but I don't want to overlook what a tremendous impact a death can have in your life, whether or not you are very close to the person. He mentioned how wild of a ride grief can be, it kind of takes you to weird places. And any of my clients who have grieved, I always tell them, like, get ready because it's a roller coaster. It takes you all over the place. It takes you to places of joy, of understanding life differently, sometimes understanding life better. Your quality of life can improve when you grieve. It can take you to the darkest places, wicked, dark places. It can take you to places of just sleepiness, anger, weird sexual stuff can happen. New memories can pop up for you. I mean, it just, you never know what to expect with it. He's had such a huge year of transformation, so many new things. I mean, so much has changed for him this year. And then in the mix of all that is the death of really important people in his family. I'm guessing All of that hasn't been pieced apart for him yet. Maybe it never will be, and that's okay too. But in all this transformation, how about his decision to go work on the farm? How about his decision to go work retail? You know, how much of that was the product of grief? It can just transform so much and it can move you emotionally and it can move your thoughts. Physically, you change. I just don't want to gloss over that. The impact of death is the most wonderful, horrible experience. Maybe one of these days, uh, he and I will have a session about just grief. Now, can I relate to someone important dying? Yes. It was 51 weeks ago today, my brother died. And the wild ride of unexpected 
ahas and unexpected sadness and unexpected anger at the most unexpected people. And it has transformed me, even though I wasn't really close to my brother, it has transformed me in unimaginable ways. It's so much. It's beautiful. It's horrible. It's, it's wonderful. It's sickening. It's, it's everything. It's everything. And that takes me to what's clinically significant about this session. And this is kind of deeper stuff. When we're talking with John, we're not really like, how do I communicate well with my boss? You know, that's not the kind of stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about like the meaning of life and all that stuff. And I believe what's clinically significant about this session is the idea of life is nothing without death. If you imagine your life, if it never ended, what is the initial feeling you get when I say your life is never, ever, ever going to end? Never. I can feel it in my throat. I can feel it like almost in my eyes, like I want to cry. Almost like I just want to be like, no, 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 no. I need there to be an end or else I have no reason to ever wake up. We have to have the feeling like we only get so many of these days. We only get so many tries. Isn't that interesting? Our nature. It has to be limited for me to enjoy it. Hmm. What a significant concept. Can we pull death in close? Our best friend, without you, I never would have enjoyed my days of life. Thank you. I'm so glad I get to experience you. Ooh, ooh. Our culture doesn't like this. Our culture's like, nope, I'm not going to die. You tell me I'm going to die. I'm going to go to every doctor. I'm going to take every medication. I'm going to do every little thing, single thing. What's interesting is we're built to die. So there's really cool mechanisms that kick into play when it's time to die that make death, for the most part, tolerable because we're supposed to. Yeah, we're, we're so afraid, even though we're, we're built to do it. Myself included. I'm not saying I'm like, I welcome death. No, <laughs> I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death. Huh. Interesting. Is something that drives me a little bit bonkers about John is how he minimizes his experiences and he minimizes him, himself. And in our next session, you'll hear me school him on this a little bit. I don't know if he heard me or not. We'll see. But he sees his life and himself as so small. Big things happen to him. He makes big changes. He does big things. His energy is big. He's powerful. He's affecting people in a really big way. And he doesn't recognize it. His grandmother died. He went to the Philippines. He got a job. He started working on a farm. He joined the Freemasons. He broke up with his long-term girlfriend, whom he absolutely loves and adores. He has completely changed his diet. He completely revamped his relationship with his parents. Now they're besties. Just a huge year. And when we start the session, he's like, yeah, no, not much has happened. What? John, these are not small things. It's really interesting. I don't know if it's necessarily like an unhealthy thing. A lot of times when people are minimizing, it's because they can't tolerate emotion or they can't face reality. And I don't see that about John because when he's emotional, he goes ahead and he, he feels it. When life is shitty, he's, he's okay with recognizing that. Or when he's made a mistake, he's cool with saying that. I, I don't see him minimizing for unhealthy reasons. I think he is, who the hell am I to say this? But I think he needs to level up. Next level, babe. It is time for you to recognize just how big you are, how big your life is, how powerful you are. So you know what my tip for listeners is going to be, right? Of course it's going to be, do you, boo? Be like John. Do the thing that's calling you. And I might be repeating myself from the session. I don't care because it's so important. I'm going to repeat it again. Your job on this planet is to be the entity that you are authentically built to be in that quiet, quiet, quiet place. When you hear your own voice speaking, what is it saying? When you really listen to your gut, what does it want you to do? Go do that. 
And if your gut is telling you, I don't want to do that, then don't do it. And if you lead your life this way, the higher power is guiding you to your highest and best place. And I know it's scary because there are 10,000 other voices all the time telling you, no, you're supposed to do this. No, you're supposed to be like that. No, you're supposed to get a degree. You're supposed to get a job. You're supposed to work here. You're supposed to act like this. You're supposed to be this skinny. You're supposed to be this fat. I don't know. I mean, they never end, right? All the things that we're supposed to be. I just felt myself get a little bit angry about it. Do your best to shut out those other voices. And if you like the way this sounds, you need to come to my retreat because I'm going to spend four days in the mountains teaching you how to shut off all these voices and listen to your own voice. Listen to your own gut. Get quiet with it and follow it. It's scary because you're not doing what everybody else wants you to do. doesn't matter. Do you. And if that means that you're going to be a chicken farmer, great. That's exactly where the world needs you. Fuck everything else. Elodie has this idea that we should have t-shirts printed that say fuck everything else. I'm just wondering, would you buy that t-shirt? Would you want to wear a fuck everything else t-shirt? Will you email us and tell us if this is a good idea or not? Consent treat podcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Appreciate it. Also, if you have questions, comments, concerns, feedback, whatever, or if you kind of want to ask me a question, and have me answer it, we're going to be doing some supplemental episodes in between seasons. And we really want to hear from you. I'm going to be taking questions, answering them, taking some comments from social media and responding to them. We're going to be collaborating with some other podcasts and doing some really fun supplemental episodes here. But if you have something you want to ask me or comments or whatever, email us consenttreatpodcast at gmail.com. Okay, rate, review, subscribe. We love you. Tell a friend. See you next week. This has been Consent to Treat. From Rachel Seavers and Elodie. <laughs> Thank you for listening and supporting beautiful people. Goodbye. Goodbye.